going to record now. So yeah, I forgot to record, but just saying one of the members has made a lower limb YouTube video. I highly recommend looking at it and we'll put our slides up as soon as he's, I'll just tell him to put the slides up. Um, this week was sad because I realized mid-stem break is in the middle of stem. Yeah, that's true. When's your mid-stem break? After week nine, that's ridiculous. Uh, we had placements this week and next week and they got canceled. So now we have Zooms and webinars. Okay, so I'm gonna get started. Let me just close all my tabs. There's nothing front in it. Moment. So I'm just getting organized. I should have done this before. I just thought I would have had time. But I don't. I'm going to share my slide. Today we're going to be discussing micro. That's what I have made lectures about. Um, it's not coming up though. Let me try again. Google document is there. I'm clicking share screen and it's not coming up. Screen one, share. Excuse the tabs. So the big micro week this week, um, usually Katya does, <laughs> that's why it's not done, but yeah. Um, we're gonna begin by discussing, so what I'll be discussing today is viruses, their pathogenesis, and you have two lectures on that. So one is with examples, one is the mechanism. And then afterwards, we'll talk about skin and muscle infections. So to begin with, muscle viruses are very small, as you would know. And evidence of this is that they require electron microscopy. They are acellular and non-living um, organisms. And the most important buzzword is they are obligate intracellular parasites. That will come up on exams most likely. In other words, they require the internal structure of the host cell in order to replicate and disseminate. They don't have that machinery themselves. On the structure of a virus, often these words can be a bit confusing, but essentially the virus genome, which is their DNA kind of, it can be RNA or DNA, but their genome or genetic code is surrounded by a protein capsid. So this is for protection and also for structure. And when it fuses with a cell membrane and goes into a nucleus perhaps, then that um, protein complex will collapse and the DNA will go into the nucleus to be transcripted. Um, the virus and this protein capsid, so this viral DNA and this protein capsid are a nucleocapsid. And these can be in three shapes, icosahedral, helical complex, and then there's also some spiral ones, but these are the main shapes. Sometimes this nuclear capsid is enveloped by a lipid bilayer, as you can see here. And this is usually of the host origin or of the cell of the person. These viruses, often these nuclear capsids will bud off and take some of the cell membrane they came from with them. And that may lead to the lysis of the cell or they might just take the cell membrane and the cell might be fine. The virion is an infective form of a virus. It is a virus that can move from cell to cell infecting and releasing its DNA material and then building itself up. Um, an eclipse phase is a phase that's once the virus is in the host cell where it is no longer infected. Do you remember, do you recommend that we know what shape each of the viruses are? So I think that's the next slide. Um, I wouldn't, I don't think, I don't think there was a question on it. I don't think it's worth it. Um, these are the classifications. More important is no DNA or RNA, and even then. These are the classifications. So the classification of a virus is dependent on its nucleic acid. So it can either be double-stranded or single-stranded. It can be RNA or DNA, and it can be positive sense or negative sense. That's a bit complicated, and they only mention it in passing, but positive sense can be immediately and directly transcripted by the cell, whereas negative sense needs to be um, converted into a means the cell can recognize the RNA and DNA polymerase, and then it can be um, replicated. Classification also depends on the shape, size, and symmetry of the virus, as well as its envelope, whether it's present or absent, and it can be helical, helical icosahedral, enveloped, or complex. This is a viral cycle you'll probably be familiar with. Um, these slides are from SEM1, so I imagine you are, but they involve the attachment of the virus to a host cell. 
then it's going to penetrate. Then that capsid or that protein capsid that protects DNA is going to shed and you'll have this free DNA floating. This can be RNA or DNA, and it can use um, mechanisms within the cells, such as DNA polymerase, RNA polymerase, and promoters, and they can go to the promoter sequences to lead to the replication of this material, and also to the replication of the proteins that will form this virion structure that will eventually bud, forming an envelope. And sometimes there's cytolysis, so there's so much... Um, all the metabolic demands of the cell is going to go in producing these viruses that is going to put strain on the cell and eventually the cell will um, necrose or apoptose, it'll um, die. That doesn't always happen, but sometimes that does happen. There are various ways a virus can infect a host. It can infect through inhaled droplets. It can infect through food and water. It can infect through body fluids and it can infect from a bite from a vector. The way infections work, is virals often have molecules that interact, uh, molecules on their cell surface that interact with receptors or molecules on the host membrane. And as a result of that, they have specificity for certain tissues where those membranes are represented. So here you can see this herpes simplex virus is interacting with the hep and sulfate proteolite glycan. And sometimes this is going to be localized. So um, sometimes it's only going to be particular tissues that is affected. So the salic acid is in the respiratory tissue, which is why you get those respiratory um, symptoms with influenza. COVID interacts with an ACE2 receptor, and that's in a variety of different tissues, which is why it can have quite a systemic effect, as well as that cytotoxic shock, which we'll talk about momentarily. Here you got GI epithelium has the receptors for the rotavirus HIV target CD4 um, T cells. The infection outcome, either infection can lead to lysis of the cell. So a cytopathic virus will kill the host rapidly. A non-cytopathic will release particles without the immediate cell death, but eventually there will be a cell death. Um, infections may be persistent. So they're long-lived and continuously release viral particles at a slow rate. These are particularly dangerous because sometimes they may be symptomless carriers. They don't know they're sick. And so they're actively in the community making other people sick. And it can also lead to really chronic damage such as hepatitis B and hepatitis C, which can lead to cirrhosis and damage of the liver. Latent viruses, such as your um, varicella zoster will become latent in your dorsal root ganglion and then reactivate to become shingles. These viruses may remain quiescent. At least their genetic material is quiescent. They're not being trans active, they do not kill or replicate, but there is a stimulus or trigger that stimulates their release from latency and transition into an active infection. So for herpes, often that's stress, so UV, or it can be physiological stress or emotional stress. Um, this is an important outcome that comes up quite a lot in the course, so it's important to understand. Some viruses can lead to transformation of a host cell into a tumor cell. So transformation is that word for the conversion of a cell into a tumor cell. And it can do this either by activating oncogenes within the host cell. It can carry their own oncogenes that are incorporated in the cell and lead it to becoming oncogenic and cancerous. Or it can inhibit, inhibit tumor suppressor mechanisms or tumor suppressor genes. This is just a slide summarizing. Um, can lead to oncogenesis, the conversion into tumor cells, cytopathology, it can cause persistent infection, which mainly the main result there is because it's persistently infected, the immune system is continually seeing its antigens, that's promoting a pro-inflammatory cytokine response, recruiting um, T lymphocytes that often stimulate in further B and T cell production and leads to a lot of damage, can lead to necrosis and damage. Latent is usually asymptomatic, but reactivation can lead to cytopathy and immunopathology. And you're doing shingles now, so um, you probably will understand that in your ICR. Some of the symptoms associated with viral, and I have divided these into their groups. So cytopathology, a cytopathic virus, causes damage by directly damaging tissue. The respiratory epithelium is in damage and it's in pain because the virus is killing it. It's, that's a pretty simple one. Oncogenesis is it's activating oncogenes or inhibiting tumor suppressor genes. That's why you're getting the symptoms associated with the malignancy. And um, you have an immunopathology. This is a really big one because it's interesting that the main kind of 
really damaging consequences of infections such as um, shark, septic shark or um, septic shock is more bacterial, but such as like really widespread inflammation and damage is often caused by our own immune system. So our immune response to the virus, as well as to the destruction of cells sometimes that are occurring in the cytopathology can lead to extensive tissue damage. Often this occurs through inflammation where immune cells infiltrate the site of the virus particle action. You'll have lots of neutrophils exploding, damaging tissue, macrophages, pro-inflammatory cytokines leading to the swelling of um, blood vessels and redness, and it's going to be hot, and you're going to stimulate um, pyrogenic activity to cause fever, so you'll be quite uncomfortable. Um, and it's responding, sometimes damage itself, as you will remember, leads to an inflammasome complex, which stimulates pro-inflammatory cytokines. I was going to say something else is that, so there's something called septic shock, and septic shock occurs when there is extensive inflammation in the system. So the, what shock is, is shock is when there's a lot of blood in your body. That means your heart can't pump blood and perfuse all your organs, and that can lead to multi-organ failure. So the reason why immunopathologies are particularly bad is that they're responding to an antigen, but by responding to it, they, they're literally killing you. They're expanding your blood vessels, all your fluids going out, you can't perfuse. And that, that's kind of why lots of these infections are dangerous. And it might even be disproportional or more dangerous than the virus itself. And the cytokine and lymphocyte deregulation. So an excessive adaptive response can cause damage. We've done that NK cells directly kill cells. And there's autoimmunity as well, which is quite interesting where the antigen on a viral cell stimulates a T cell which cross-reacts with the self-antigen that looks quite similar to the pathogenic antigen. So a classic example of this is rheumatic disease. So the, for some reason, the antigens on streptococcal pyogenase stimulate these T cells, and these stimulate T cells create antibodies that react with the cells on your heart valves. So that's also another way of immunopathology through autoimmunity. And this is a confusing slide, this is commonly referred to in the lecture you're about to see. All it's saying is you can classify viruses based on their DNA structure, their RNA structure, whether they're single-stranded, double-stranded, whether they're negative sense or positive sense. As I said before, the only thing you'd be unfamiliar here with is the positive sense. All positive sense means is that it can be directly transcripted in the nucleus and doesn't need to undergo it a further step. I have at the end a more detailed diagram explaining this. It's really not that important. Um, so with a DNA virus, often the mechanism of action is for it to work, all you need to do is get that DNA in the nucleus and the magic will happen. All the proteins will act on it like it usually acts on the host cell. And that can lead to the formation of mRNA from RNA polymerase. Um, a way that DNA viruses subvert the host is through controlling one, the cellular mechanism, host mechanism to replicate itself. So here you can see the um, this viral particle has attached to this membrane it's been um, it's been it's come in to the endocytose the genome has been released the protein caps it has dissolved gone away it's translocated into the nucleus where it's been transcripted the transcription is going to lead to mrna um, production which will then undergo translational post-translation modification which will then be re-put into the cell so that, like let's say it makes that protein capsid so these cells have that protein capsid to continue the process. Um, as well as this protein production, it also resynthesizes the DNA so it can be assembled. And it essentially just makes itself. So it hijacks the cell to make its own um, viral particles. It also reprograms cellular control pathways to promote replication and extensive future dissemination by attenuating or subverting host response. So one, they hijack the system. Two, they affect the immune system. Often they go in immune privileged sites without many immune cells where they can occur there. Um, this I would know of your DNA, double-stranded DNA, especially no DNA is herpes simplex virus. Herpes is talked about a lot because it's quite common. It's transmitted by via skin-to-skin -skin contact. Um, often many herpes establish latent infections um, Meredith says herpes for today never go away, which is a nice way to remember that. So um, in times of stress, often they can reactivate. Um, the lesions are watery blisters of the mouth and generally heal with a scab. Um, if you touch that watery blister, it's an easy way to get infected. 
HSV1 are oral heart herpes, HSV2 are genital herpes. Apparently now there's more cross reactivity, so these distinctions are less significant, but I don't know, that's just what a lecturer said. But um, for your exams, HSV1 is oral herpes, HSV2 is genital herpes. Reactivation is often due to stress, tissue damage, and UV light. And HSV2 is um, particularly dangerous because its reactivation can be asymptomatic and lead to shedding, which is why people recommend particularly condoms or um, some forms of protection against sexually transmitted diseases. Human papillomavirus is, um, there's about 170 types of human papillomaviruses. They're benign warts in the skin or genitals, and they're particularly significant because they may transform in cancer. Classically, cervical cancer, that's what a pap smear is. A pap smear is screening for papillomavirus to detect early cervical cancer. That because it presents quite late, has a, had used to have a really high mortality rate, but because of the screening, that's gone down dramatically. Herpes can evade due to two ways. They can interfere with complement, particularly C3. Oh, I don't remember C3A or C3, but they um, interfere with the C3 complement and they interfere with the FC receptor. Inside, they, as I said before, they invade immune privileged cells where there's not many circulating immune cells. I'm just going to check something. Okay. Where there's not many circulating immune cells and they inhibit cytokines that are pro-inflammatory, such as type 1 interferons. They also inhibit direct um, cell lysis by inhibiting NK cells, which see if there is no MHC1 class present, they kill that cell. They often also kill tumor cells. And um, CD8 cells, which if there's not, um, if it's not a self-antigen, they'll apoptose that. I don't know if it recognizes an antigen. So the antigen will contact, as you know, you might know the CD4 cell. CD4 will then stimulate the CD8 cell to look for that antigen and kill it. Um, part one done. Part two, this part's shorter. Now we're talking about positive single-stranded RNA viruses. So these viral genomes can be used directly as mRNA as well because they're positive sense. Um, SARS-CoV virus, two virus is an example of this. As I mentioned before, it binds to the ACE2 receptor and its main huge immunopathology that causes really devastating consequences is an immunopathology due to an inflammation in the lung where these ACE2 receptors are found quite commonly. The systemic effect is usually due to an overactive immune response due to a cytokine storm. So the immune system is going to be hyperstimulated and release lots of pro-inflammatory cytokines, which will have actions all over the body. Um, positive single-stranded RNA virus. Another one is hepatitis C. This is a really important one to know. They emphasize it quite a lot in the lecture, and we talk about it commonly in second year as well. So I imagine it's important in the clinics. Um, transmission is via blood, most commonly injecting drugs. So IV drug use is a huge risk factor for hep C and so is tattoos. So if someone often says they traveled overseas recently, important to ask if injecting drugs or tattoos or if they've had tattoos, because if they aren't sterilized properly, it's a very, very common route of hepatitis C. Eventually, this virus will travel to the liver where it will infect hepatocytes. It's particularly dangerous. It can be, it's one of the, the reasons why they emphasize it is it can be acute, it can be latent, and it can be chronic. So it can persist, as persist or chronic. So um, frequent mutations means it's very hard for the immune system to target it. It leads to, because it's persistently there, there's an effective immune response always. Um, fibrosis is part of the immune response. It stimulates fibroblasts. And um, that can lead to the cirrhosis of the liver, which can cause liver failure and death. Um, most people will only have mild to moderate diseases and will not show symptoms. It can be acute, chronic, or transforming, causing liver cancer. This is a nice diagram I stole from the lecture. You have your acute phase or exposure, and then 15 to 25% of these people will be resolved. So that's done. Then you have um, some people will then go into a chronic phase with 75 to 85%. I think Meredith revised these numbers. That's why they're different. Then you've got, um, I'm just going to use the one in the zero diagram, but these actual numbers don't really matter. You just need to know the classifications. So it can be resolved. Then most, some people it gets resolved in, other people it is chronically persists, and that chronic infection causes particular constant inflammation. Inflammation stimulates fibroblasts, and if that's even excessive, can lead to cirrhosis. Can remember alcohol also does similar function, maybe you remember from that. 
and um, you either need eventually um, cause end stage liver disease and may need a transplant or death will occur. And this is um, cancer can also occur, addict cell carcinoma, and that can lead to liver cancer. These are some outcomes. So it can be chronically infected. This is your viral RNA present in the body. So it's really increased in your acute phase. Then it's going to go down in your latent phase and it's going to come back for a chronic stable infection. Um, acute infection can be cleared. So it comes up and it goes down. And this is looking at the antibodies targeting these viral RNAs. Then these anti, you can have. And it, so the reason why you measure antibodies is it's really hard to directly measure RNA. So if you just take serology, if you take a blood test, you can see the protein antibodies in it. Um, here in a super infection is an excessive um, infection. These have pretty poor outcomes. And reinfection, you have your acute phase, it becomes latent, then it's clear, then it comes back again. Now we're gonna talk about retroviruses. These are single-stranded RNA that use um, double-stranded DNA as intermediates. So this is an explanation of what Post sense RNA is. So you need a positive sense DNA to go to a positive RNA and then to be combined to this function. So you have a retrovirus with a single stranded RNA. It's reverse transcriptase. So if you remember that RNA, that is the exception to the um, central dogma. It can be reverse transcriptase into negative sense DNA. It is then combined into a double strand DNA, which is then transcriptase again into RNA, which um, can be good. So there's two pathways as I talked about before. One is the formation of the protein structures necessary for the structure of the virion. The other is made the genetic replication of the genetic material to be carried out. Um, extension to the central dogma, and this is they won a Nobel Prize for this in 1973 or 1975, I don't remember. This is a typical um, retrovirus. You'll have your reverse transcriptase to transform your RNA into DNA, your integrase to integrate into the cell, and your protease to cleave to leave the cell. HIV mainly infects CD4 positive T cells. And you can remember CD4 positive T cells are essential in the adaptive immune system. So they um, are what stimulates B cells to become plasma cells and to release antibodies. And they're important for serotyping. So sometimes B cells by themselves can release IgM. But IgM is often immediate response. It has low affinity. And while it is effective in complement, it's not effective in a sustained immune response. Without CD4 positive T cells, you can't serotype switch that plasma cell to start secreting IgG or um, IgA if it needs to protect the mucosa or anything like that. So it's really greatly reduced your immune system. And CD4 plus T cells are obviously important for CD8 um, cytotoxic T cells. So HIV lysis, CD4 T cells to reduce the level. And um, yeah, the mechanism of action is they infect really long lived cells. So they have a reservoir of persistent infection and they persistently infect macrophages. And this is high yield, they do ask that. This is a cycle where, as in most viruses, the HIV will fuse to the host cell surface. The HIV um, will then kind of disseminate inside. This nucleus protein capsule will dissolve and the viral. RNA is going to be reverse transcriptase into DNA into the cell, then reverse trans into the um, nucleus in the genome. Then um, transcriptase will then convert that into protein to be used for the production of the virus and also into the genetic material for it's a bud off and to be incorporated when it buds off. This is what people often get HIV and AIDS confused. HIV is the virus. AIDS is a condition where the CD4 positive T cells, I think it's less than 400 um, cells per microliter. I forgot what that is. That's so bad. I did chemistry two years ago. Um, cells per this unit. Um, so when it's less than 400, I just remember, you can get something called um, AIDS. Um, what can I tell you here? Um, you can see... Um, Often very opportunistic effect, infections affect AIDS, ones that usually won't affect someone with a normal functioning immune system. Um, in this acute phase, there's a huge rise in these, a huge decline in CD4. Then there's a latency where they kind of increase a little bit, and then they're gonna gradually decline more and more and more until it's really life-threatening. 
Um, I didn't put in the drugs because you do that in farm, but there's now lots of drugs. There's drug triple therapy that targets HIV and there's also um, prophylaxis that's very effective. Another explanation of negative sense, just because I kind of obsessed over this because I didn't understand and I didn't realize how unimportant it was. Negative sense, single-stranded RNA virus, or at least for us, I'm sure it's very important um, for the universe, but for our exams, maybe not so much. So you have a negative-stranded parental RNA, and RNA polymerase can make it positive-stranded, and then as it's positive-stranded, it can then be used by the host cell to make these proteins. And then these proteins are incorporated. I've I explained this a lot, so hopefully that's stuck. And then um, these negative stranded can then also use RNA polymerase to composite stranded RNA to be the genome of the virus. This is an example of influenza is a negative sense single stranded RNA virus. It infects the upper and lower respiratory tract. Um, it's neuraminidase will cleave silic acid, sorry, hemoglutin binds with silic acid to allow the virus to enter. So it's really a specific where the silic acid is and your amidase will clear the silic acid so the particle can butt off and there are drugs that target these to limit influenza, but often it's not, not super used because um, it's better for these infections are self-resolving mostly. Um, and there can be systemic symptoms caused by a cytokine response with a marked immunopathology that leads to acute disease. Um, they mentioned Ebola. It's quite a significant part of the lecture on Ebola. It wasn't that examinable. I imagine it would have been influenced by when there was that Ebola outbreak, and that's why it's... I'm sure now there'll be huge things about COVID, but in four years, they might not be that examinable. But there's four types of Ebola. They spread through bodily contact with bodily fluids, such as urine, saliva, and blood. And it's a classic example of zoonosis, where a virus originates from an animal, it then combines into a human through that transmission. And it's something we haven't seen before. Our immune systems really struggle to cope with. There's an incubation of two to one days, with symptoms of fevers, chills, malaise, and myalgia. Um, it's kind of scary though, because like you can just have a zoonosis that's infectious and then imagine COVID, but if it was really, really had a really high mortality for everyone. But regardless, um, it leads, it's quite fatal, particularly because it leads to multi-organ failure with hem hemorrhagic symptoms, which means everything bleeds. And the reason everything bleeds is due to hypovolemic blo blood due to multi-organ failure. So I explained shock before. We explained septic shock, which is blood loss caused by the visodilation with all that blood leaking into the tissues. Hypovolemic shock is literally because you are losing blood. You're just bleeding out. So you don't have enough to pump around. It enters through mucosal surface or breaks or abrasions, and it uses multiple receptors for attachments, which is why it affects such a wide variety of cells and organs. These are just some examples of really different cells that it all affects. And it's... Um, as a lytic viral replication with acute cytokine release. So we've done the first two bits. Now we're in the final stretch. Oh, I need water. I'm going to, give me a second. I'm going to get someone to get me water. Skype, I still use Skype. Okay, let's get back. infections of skin and muscle. This is a dot point. So if you just look at this, you've understood most of it, kind of. So um, these are the three mechanisms of how skin and soft tissue infection occur. You'll have breach of intact skin. Often this is um, involved in surgery, which is an iatrogenic complication of infection. Burns, which as you can remember, you have different severities of burns. Some affect the superficial layer, some go down to the dermis, epidermis, subcutaneous tissue, depending on how serious it is. And that can breach skin, lacerations, pressure sores, and IV, which is another iatrogenic. Um, catheters would also be another breach of intact skin. Um, these are the manifestations of systemic infections. So salmonella can produce rose spots. Meningitis, which is incredibly dangerous, can lead to particular spots. And herpes simplex and various cellar zoster can lead to um, vesicular rashes in dermatome complexes and can disseminate, all of these can disseminate systemic infections, can just be the dissemination of a viremia or bacteria now, which means virus in the blood, bacteria in the blood. And that's really dangerous. These can lead to septic shock because they go all over the body. Toxin mediated damage is when the toxins of these pyogenases cause these diseases. So, Scarlet fever, and as you can remember, 
toxic shock syndrome has that TSS1 antigen, that super antigen that leads to an increased affinity between the T cell and the antigen. And it kind of hyper produces a cytokine response and a cytokine storm. And it's really dangerous. And these are also classically involved with like, it used to be tampon, tampons were produced for a really long period of time. Not as prevalent now, but that's where that comes from. It's important historical no knowledge and it's quite buzzwordy. Infections and sites. So this is a nice way to visualize the skin. You have um, your keratinized epithelium. Some infections will affect keratinized structures. There's some fungal infections we'll talk about, like ringworm. Oh, it's here, like ringworm. Um, you have epidermis. Dermis. So you can really divide these diseases into where they affect. And based on where they affect, you can see how dangerous they'll be. So cellulitis is in this tissue, subcutaneous fat tissue. And this just goes everywhere. So this cellulitis can be really dangerous and can really infect all over. Likewise, fascia is what separates the outside, the external outside from your inside. So if you've infected your fascia, that can really spread all throughout your body. I've um, listed the main infections. So no empedico infects epidermis, cellulitis, subcutaneous, necrotizing fasciitis, and fascia. I'd say these two are the most important and they're pretty easy to remember. Um, try empedico epidermis as well, but I can see why that would be more difficult. Um, this is, I got this straight from the lecture. I thought this was a great slide. Um, it's just showing you what these words mean. So erythema is a redness due to vasodilation, which is often an inflammatory response. A macula is a flat area of altered skin color. These are often presented in a fungal infection. They can lead to hypo or hyperpigmentated macula. Papillae are circumscribed elevated levels of the skin. A vesicle is a small blister containing clear fluid. Your herpes are often vesicular and then they'll um, become blister and kind of crust over. Your bulla are large blisters containing fluid and your pustules are vesicles or bulla containing a cloudy fluid. So usually the cloudy whiteness is dead neutrophils. I don't know if it is in that case, but that's generally a rule of thumb. So I've made all these tables, which are more for notes than presentation, but um, it's just easy to compare them, I thought. I probably should make them a bit prettier. But yeah, so these are Staph aureus infections. Staph aureus is if in doubt you choose it. Some examples are folliculitis, boils, carbuncle, hard to remember boils is easier to remember because it's like biblical but the others are a bit harder um can lead to abscess in pedigo but it's real i got confused because in pedigo is also very um, much caused by strep pyogenase so think of both of them for this and it's also often called in surgical wounds because staph aureus is a significant floor part of the floor of the skin so staphylococcal skeletal skin, skin syndrome often affects babies. It's rarely fatal, fatal, and it's where orange produces toxins that leads to large skin desquamation. So you're literally taking off the skin and it forms large blisters. Apparently, it's quite shocking to see. Toxic shock syndrome, strongly associated with tampon use, buzzword, is when a super antigen, which causes a high affinity to lymphocyte to bind to an antigen, leading to an excessive immune response on staph aureus, and is an exotoxin that is particularly potent can cause multiple organ system failure through septic shock. Pyogenase, so that's aureus, the infections, two huge infections, definitely need to know. Next one is pyogenase. In pedigo, we discussed, so it's mentioned twice, so it's pretty important. Also very much worth searching up what these look like. Um, in pedigo, Erepsilius, which is a dermal lymphatic clearly demarcated area of erythemia or redness. And then these are the skin ones, and these are more of the systemic high important ones. So scarlet fever is a pyrogenic exotoxin that leads to a strawberry tongue classically. So if you see anyone with a really stra strawberry tongue, that's a buzzword for scarlet fever. We, uh, we've spoken about toxic shock syndrome, the super antigen of the pyrogen leads to multi shock and foilia. Often you can just get penicillin for these. These are some skin conditions with their severity increasing from left to right. All of them are quite dangerous though, but cellulitis is mostly caused by RS and pathogens. You initially treat it with antibiotics, but it can get worse. And it's where traumatized tissue can be infected. Often anaerobes can get inside and they like your internal environment. And a buzzword for this is diabetic cellulitis or because that can cause a diabetic foot ulcer because diabetics, usually the high blood sugar, okay, it does allow bacteria to grow, but it also reduces um, perfusion of the blood vessel and also damages peripheral nerves. So it's harder to heal 
and it's harder to sense when there's damage. Necrotizing fasciitis, a flesh, flesh eating bacteria, is a rapidly spreading infection that's commonly caused by mixed organisms. So that's a trick question. I'd get that wrong. So, what is the most common cause of necrotizing fasciitis? I would write strep pyogenase, but the answer is it's mixed organisms most commonly. If it is a single organism, then a strep pyogenase. So don't get confused by that. Treatment is either the removal of tissue or antibiotics. And gas gangrene is really horrible. It's where spores from, so it's um, typically, classically a question will be someone falls on a motorbike, they graze their leg and they're in, host and they are in hospital. Um, what's happening? So spores from the environment can gain access to internal tissues and most common cause is clostridium perfringens. Definitely want to know that. It multiplies in the subcutaneous tissue and can even invade deeper into the muscle and the fascia and really get quite deep. Um, it can produce necrosis and gas. So it's often described, if you hear the word crepitus described with an injury, um, that means gas gangrene, that means it's really dangerous and the patient can die. So get crepitus is just the popular movement of gas. Immediate surgery is required to either remove tissue, antibiotics, or amputation. Just a slide on. Acne, acne occurs because of sebum production with desquamitation, which blocks the sebaceous ducts. Not too hard to remember. Um, puberty, sebum production, sebaceous ducts, as you can find. You can desquamination kind of makes sense. I don't think you need to remember this. Um, easy to remember because there's acne in May. Viral infections, so from, these are ones that affect adults. We've spoken about these two. HPV, double-stranded DNA, more than 170 types, leads to warts, can transform into cancer. Um, HSV, herpes 1, saliva, oral herpes, herpes 2, genital herpes, treated with a cyclovir, which is an antiviral. I rushed through that because we've talked about it. Um, Marcella zoster and shingles, you're going through this in ICL, so you're probably really good at this. Um, first infection is varicella or chickenpox. It's okay if you're not there. Reactivation is shingles. Varicella zoster is a double strand DNA virus. So remember, herpes DNA, probably the most important one to know of like is a DNA, is it RNA? Herpes is DNA. Transmission can be from um, inhalation from respiratory secretions and saliva, but more commonly, I think, is direct contact with skin lesions. And there are antiviral treatments such as the cyclovir, velociclovir, and fenciclovir, and a live attenuated vaccines available. Um, and you have shingles. So these, these virus is quite dangerous for pregnant women. So often pregnant women are going to get vaccinated against these, and they're also going to try and avoid people or children with chicken pox as much as possible. Because if they've been infected, they can get shingles and develop shingles quite and chicken pox. So these are quite damaging to the fetus. I think chicken pox is the damaging one to the fetus. So especially if the mother's never had chicken pox before, they really want to avoid people with it. Sometimes the vaccine isn't fully effective though. sometimes, even if they're vaccinated, they might want to do that. So shingles is caused by a reactivated dormant varicella zoster virus, which resides in the dorsal ganglion. It affects the dermatome with a vesicular rash, which we saw before. Eventually that will cross over and blister, and that's when it's no longer infectious. It's described it was as paresthesia and pain that made proceed rash development and there's a rare complication of post-hepatic neuralgia where is pain that remains after the shingle resolves and that's treated with antidepressants for some reason i have no idea why um, viral infections in children so you get your mumps your mmr vaccine so mumps don't have here your mumps in second year for a little bit you have measles and rubella measles i think all you need to know about these is that they're in the mmr vaccine otherwise this is a lot and I, I don't think you need to know. Maybe no toga virus is rubella. Um, measles is paramox virus. Um, Kotsiaki virus is a bit more high yield. And that's just because it's typically classically um, on the limbs, so on your hands, on your feet, and on your mouth. And that's called Kotsiaki virus. And there was research into whether that was a like a transformation virus for type 1 diabetes, but I don't think there was any conclusive, anything conclusive about that. Bones and joints. So I don't remember much of this. Diabetic foot ulcer, I remember. Septic arthritis became more important this year, but everything else, I don't, I don't remember osteomyelitis. So osteomyelitis is acutely caused by um, staphylococcus aureus, chronically by TB, and it has symptoms such as fever, localized pain, and tenderness. Diabetic foot ulcer, very important. It's a combination of the neuropathy in diabetes, of an infection easily infected and ischemia due to that poor blood supply and is often stimulated by trauma. 
It can be caused by a variety of pathogens. Um, arthralgia and arthritis, septic arthritis is when an infection invades a joint from the blood. Organisms are common staph aureus, salmonella influenza, and nice gonorrhea, and, has these, and that's a medical emergency because it can lead to sepsis. These are some fungal we were talking about before. So you have superficial ones, which just lead to hypo or hypopigmented macules. If you remember, macules are flat rashes and they're associated with sweating. Cutaneous, there's two types of cutaneous mycoses. One is caused by ringworm, dermatophytosis, and this affects skin epidermis, hair and nail, or keratinized structures. So you can see hair here, nail here, and skin here. And then there's also um, cutaneous mycosis caused by candiditis, and it's usually caused by albicans, and it affects oral and esophageal areas, especially, and usually in a um, immunocompromised. It's part of the normal flora, so it's um, most people are fine. Um, signs and symptoms, so thrush and diaparash, that's quite a buzzword, I'd remember that, and to a less extent, poultry medicine, penile, and penile infections. I mean, to less of an extent in terms of how much it's examinable, not how prevalent it is, I don't know how prevalent it is, but definitely remember diaparash and thrush, that's everywhere. Antibiotics can also cause thrush to a candidatus. Um, that's the presentation I have today. So I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna go back to you. Um, give me a second, I can't find you. Ah, oh, I thought I lost it. That was terrifying. I can't see the Zoom. Can you just message to say you can hear me, if you can hear me? Okay, wonderful. That was terrifying. So I can't find you. I'll just stop sharing. Stop. <laughs>